let's get this thing started. Let's welcome John Bernhelm to our second ever interview on The Aquatic Life. Thanks so much for joining us, John. How you doing? Doing great. Thanks so, so much for having me. I feel like we should have like a crowd cheer button. <laughs> from, uh, uh, you know what? I'll add that. Canned I'll applause. Add that Some canned <laughs> applause. <laughs> Well, here, exactly. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Right. Don't, let, let's give John <laughs> there we go. an ovation. Thanks so much for joining us. We're super excited uh, to, um, to chat with you. Thanks so much for volunteering to talk with us, John. Why don't you give everyone a, a little background? Tell us about yourself. So I live in San Francisco. I'm a California diver, but I love going tropics as well. And I'm a VR and, and video game designer. And uh, I think that my love for adventure and photography and visuals, I've really... Um, come together in both my photography life and in my development life. That's right awesome. On. So why don't you tell us how you got started? When did you start diving? Uh, how many dives do you have? Give us. Let's go through the basics and get that out of the way before we get into the fun stuff. I've been diving about 11 years now. Uh, I grew up in the southeast uh, near Atlanta, and so it's pretty far away from the ocean. And every time we'd go to the beach, um, I would be so excited because I was a huge fan of sharks and whales. I was one of those kids that had, you know, sharks of the world posters all over my room. Um, and, uh, but then I realized uh, my mom was like, Hey, you know, you really want to be a marine biologist, but every time we go to the beach, you get sick or you get sun poisoning or you get stung <laughs> by a, a jellyfish. And it's true. I had a string of years where every time we went to the beach, something bad would happen to me and I'd end up on the couch and not feeling good. And so I realized, man, maybe I'm not cut out to be a marine biologist and didn't really think about it again uh, until I moved to California after college. Um, I met my wife, who's my girlfriend, and she invited me to a family trip to Maui. And mm. we realized, well, if we're going to go there, maybe we should get scuba certified. So we went down to Monterey and uh, got um, our open water with SSI. And nice. I've been diving ever since, probably probably about 175 dives now. Um, and uh, my goal has generally been to try to go about once a month down in Monterey or somewhere else. Uh, haven't been in a couple months and I'm really itching to get back in the water. Cold water, man. I don't know how you do it. Well, we're, we're going we're gonna to get there. This is kind of my yeah. secret. Um, my secret plan is to get John to convince you and I don't to be much better at diving locally in colder oh, water. I'll, so. I'll, don't get me wrong. I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go and I'll have a good time. I might freeze my ass off while I'm doing it, but. <laughs> yeah, so, but John, John's gonna tell us all about that in a bit, but before we get there, why don't you, you're an underwater photographer as well, right, John? Yep, super amateur. I've been shooting for about a year and a half with Olympus TG5, uh, but just getting into my strobe setup, I've got a two strobe setup and playing with lenses and stuff like that. Um, when I first started diving, uh, I, I had a uh, old, Canon Elf, Digital Elf, and I got a cheap housing for it. And right. that was a great thing to start with because this camera at the time, you could buy this camera on Craigslist for maybe 15 to 30 bucks. So I actually bought two or three of them and I flooded two or three of them. <laughs> um, and, but I, you know, I really learned what it's like to, uh, you know, task load in terms of working on your buoyancy and uh, making sure you're a good dive buddy while also having a camera. I didn't take good photos. Um, I actually upgraded from that to a GoPro Hero 2 and nice. had that for a couple of years. And then, um, but the Olympus TG5 has been a great step up from there where I can learn, learn about lighting and also I can shoot in RAW so I can then use Lightroom to make things look infinitely better. And I think that was the big aha moment for me was when I first started shooting in RAW and taking things in Lightroom and doing some post-processing um, and just being like, wow, okay, here's, here's where the color went. Uh, okay. Yes. It, it makes a world of difference. And then you go one step more and add strobes, and then you go, yep. oh, that's where the color is. <laughs> and then you, and then you're like, oh wait, actually, I'm blowing these things out now. I'm doing right. light, you know, pull it back. Right. So it's a it's a constant uh, learning curve. That's the thing I love about underwater photography is, um, you know, I, I actually haven't done a whole lot of land photography. I don't have a DSLR. Uh, I really am about the critters, and for me, being underwater is amazing because the creatures just act naturally around you in a way that you walk through the forest and like you're lucky to see a couple of birds. Uh, maybe you'll see a mammal from a distance, but as soon as it hears you, it's, it's gone. All those forest animals have learned, stay away from humans. Um, don't come near us. Uh, very rarely are you going to get something epic and you've got to be like in Yellowstone or just having a really amazing 
experience on land, but underwater, you can just be like, oh, there's an amazing creature. That creature just ate that other creature. Those creatures are mating, and then they're maybe going to eat those other creatures, and you just see that all happen in front of you. Um, it's just it's, it's amazing. And then also you go from seeing things like whale sharks all the way down to tiny nudibranchs um, and, and small, like, uh, uh, cup enemies. Like, it's it, everywhere you look, there's life, and I love it. Right. I love that. Right. Yeah, yeah. Actually, Todd and I were very similar. We started out and had a couple of Olympus SP 350s, 310s, yes. 350s, 350s, something 350s, like that. Yeah. With a, uh, you know, just bought a Eichelite housing for them and, and very similar. Started out and then we bought them because they shot raw and they weren't too expensive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So and that's great. It's great to have something that you don't have to worry so much about. Yeah. Um, if you lose or flood or break, and then with the, the Olympus TGs, those are waterproof uh, cameras by themselves. By themselves they're, good, right. they're good down to 50 feet. So I've gone snorkeling with mine as long as yeah. you rinse it off afterwards with fresh water. Yeah. It's pretty good. So it's just like, uh, you know, I'm look, eyeing mirrorless cameras. I'd love to move into a, a good mirrorless or maybe a, a, a DSLR setup. But for now, I realize that my skill, uh, I still have a lot to learn with this camera, especially working with two strobes and getting your strobe positioning right. Well, to be uh, to be perfectly honest and candid, it's it's less the camera and, and more what you do with it. Um, I I shoot professionally; it's what I do for a living, and I can do the same thing with a cheap three hundred dollar Canon Rebel or a point and shoot. Canon elf that you can put in manual mode and you have to push all the, you know, you have to be a contortionist with your hands to push five or six different buttons to, to change your manual settings. Um, you can do the same things. You just have more ease of doing them when you start getting into the higher level cameras. So I, I think what you're, what you've been doing, the track you've been going on by working with your strobes, working on lighting and composition, that's that's really the uh, the workspace, the headspace to to be in to really move forward with photos. And it's just you know you know there's a learning curve every time you get a new piece of equipment. Oh, so, yes. So oh, yeah. you know I know that there's a gap. If I get a new camera, there's going to be a period of time where I will not be make, taking as good of photos as I'm taking right now. Right. And at some point that that gap is going to be worth taking. But for now, it's more like well, I'd rather spend that money on dive trips and yep. getting yeah. getting more water time so that I can yep. build up my skills and, uh, and see where I can go from there. Yep. And I was, uh, I was very impressed to, to hear that you went about things what we consider the right way and you know, becoming a good diver and being concerned about being a good diver and a good buddy before photography. You know, and that's, I see so many um, students that I've had and other diver, new divers on boats where they, you know, they're wanting to have their cameras during the certification course. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you're doing a lot, <laughs> you know, uh, in class. You don't need to add, you know, the, the task of trying to run a camera as well. Yeah, and I just remember my first dives in, in Maui. I uh, was an air hog. Um, man, I had this, uh, it was such a bummer. I remember coming up, uh, one time I was the first one on, uh, up the boat and I was like, man, you know, I really, was really sucking down air that time. I, I need to work on that. And then five, 10 minutes later, everybody else comes up and they were like, wow, those gray sharks that were feeding <laughs> off of that bait ball was amazing. And I was always, like, always the case. I spent oh, yeah. that whole dive trying not to hit things and just trying to, like, <laughs> um, but it does come, become second nature after a while. And I think that's, you know, when, Nowadays, I hop in the water, I can descend and clear my ears without ever touching my nose. I don't think about it. It's just natural. It happens automatically. I don't have to think about uh, inflating or deflating my BCD. It's just you, you just work on that reflex and response. And that's what you need because your, your head is going to be on the dive and on the photos you're taking. Yep, exactly. So, so uh, how is it diving up in uh, Monterey area? Well, I love Monterey. Uh, it's you know it's about a two-hour drive from San Francisco, um, so it's it's a place I can go during during a day. So I'll, I'll like wake up early on a Saturday or Sunday morning, really early, and I uh, get down to Monterey right when the dive shops open, pick up some tanks, meet my buddy who I probably coordinated with online, um, and then we'll go hit hit some local beaches for uh, shore dives. Um, the way I think about California diving is it's like like it's more like hiking or backpacking compared to staying in a, 
uh, or camping compared to staying in a nice resort. So yes, you can go on a liveaboard uh, or be at a dive resort somewhere, and that's lovely. Who doesn't love that? But um, an hour or two from you. in case the weather's a little worse um and i but i feel like it's worth it fair enough and what are the some of the favorite things that you uh that you see down in up in monterey it starts like down in monterey but up in monterey. Uh, well the the two things that i love down there are sea lions and nudibranchs um the the classic dive site in monterey is called breakwater so it's at, at this pier and this river gets certified but it's still one of the best dives around because it's just this long rocky reef or rock wall with, um, uh, with kelp at the end. And so you can go down and if you go to the very end, there's a sea lion rookery there. So sea lions will come down some around you. It's like a place you'll get to see sea lions 100% of the time if you want to, um, which is awesome. And, uh, and there's also kelp forest sections of it and then the rocks are just crawling with invertebrates. So uh, with my camera, especially the Olympus TG series is really, has a really good macro functionality built in. So you don't need an additional lens. You can just go for that. And then also if the lighting is, if the conditions are not amazing, cool. You can still get really close to a nudibranch and take a shot of it. We've got some beautiful nudibranchs there. Um, and uh, I love looking for them in the, uh, in the rocks and uh, spending my time just, just trying to photo photograph the really crazy weird shapes and colors they come in. Nice. So you like the real, the real small macro stuff. That's, that tends to be what I go for. And part of that, again, is in my learning curve as a photographer. Um, I just got my first wide angle lens recently. And uh, you just don't get, um, like a good day in Monterey is maybe 20, 30 feet visibility. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've been, I have been there when it was like 80 feet, uh, felt like, like, like tropics. Um, <laughs> very rarely, it's been a couple dives I've been there. Uh, I also have been there where you can't see your fin. Um, right. So, uh, so, the good thing is if you're prepared to do macro, then the worst case scenario, you can crawl along the rocks and find crabs and nudibranchs and, and enemies and take some great shots of those. Um, so that's like on a, on a bad day where it's five foot visibility, you can still have a great dive. And so I think being prepared for whatever's, whatever conditions you might find is a great way to be flexible. Um, and the other thing is we've got a really great community of divers in Monterey and people meet on Facebook and online and uh, people share dive reports. So people live there who every morning will kind of be like, here's, here's what this beach looks like today. And you learn how to read the conditions and learn how to plan ahead and learn when to call it. Sometimes it's not worth getting up at five in the morning and driving for two hours. Yeah. But if you're queued in, you've got a good sense of like what it's gonna be like and you can be mentally prepared for those conditions. Do you have any official dive clubs that you're part of or you just have your, uh, your group of friends, online friends that you regularly count on to meet up with? Uh, I'm a member of a couple of Facebook groups. There's a Monterey Bay Scuba Divers Open. That's awesome. And there's a photography group there as well. I'm not a member of any official clubs, but um, cool. I also, the the dive shop I, I, I did my training with, they host fun dives once a month. And so those are like, you pay 15 or 20 bucks, you get to do a cookout afterwards and you get to meet 20 people who are all going to go shore diving together. And that's a great way to learn new sites. They, they rotate sites. So you might be like, hey, I've really been wanting to try this uh, this beach I've heard a lot about, but I I don't know any, I don't know the topology there. I want to learn it, and so you can go there and dive with people who know it, or follow one of their guides, um, or just meet a buddy and just go for it. So uh, there's a lot of chances to meet up with people and go diving. Do you dive in a, Do you dive in a dry suit or a wetsuit? What do you What gear do you usually use for your local dives? Well, I started with a seven millimeter uh, Farmer John, two piece <laughs> Farmer John, yeah. which um, I, I like in a lot of ways. Like I like that you can take the top part off uh, after a dive and that's very comfortable, easy to put on, easy to take off. Uh, the problem is you've got to counteract that with so much lead. Um, so I usually try to dive with steel tank to lower that. Yeah. Um, I would love to get a, into a backplate wing setup sometime to help that as well. but. These days I dive with a uh, Aqualung 7, 8 millimeter semi-dry soul effects. And that's amazing. It's harder to get in and out of, but it keeps me really warm. And uh, I don't have to have near as much weight as the Farmer John. Um, some, about half the people there dive, dive dry. But the good thing about Monterey is usually the temperature when you get out is fine. You know, if you pop out and it's a sunny day in the 60s or 70s, uh, you warm up quickly. It's not like um, 
Seattle, uh, where, you know, it's, you know, it might be 45 degrees underwater and then 45 degrees above the water. Uh, I, f I find that as long as it's warm when I get out, I can warm up really quickly and feel really good about it. There's also all, all kinds of tricks like bringing a thermos full of hot water and dumping it down the back of your wetsuit. Um, everyone has their own way to be comfortable. And kind of coming with the hiking backpacking analogy, it's like you got to learn, like if you're going to be backpacking, you got to learn like what socks really work for you so your feet don't hurt. And you got to get good right. boots and you just got to be prepared. So I do think it's one of those things where if you're coming and you're renting gear and diving cold, um, you're probably not going to have as good, much, as good a time as if you've found something that really fits you, that works with you. Uh, so you don't have to, and then you learn this, that system so you don't have to worry about it. Um, so what's the uh, water temperature on average up there for you? It's usually in the low 50s Fahrenheit. Um, so I mean, I think you, sometimes it'll be, it'll dip into the 40s, but usually it's between, you know, 50 and 55 degrees. At depth um, or at the surface? That is, uh, that, that's usually what my dive computer says. I don't usually dive that deep there. Um, that's the other thing is I, I prefer uh, shallower, longer shallower dives. And yep. so usually we bottom out at maybe 40, 50 feet max, yeah. especially yeah. if we're doing shore dives there. There's some places you can get deep and some of the technical divers will go out on scooters and do some crazy, crazy deep dives right from shore there because there's a, the yeah, channel goes through there, right? The big channel, exactly. So, yeah. uh, but honestly, I mean, the light penetration is not going to get down there. A lot of the critters aren't. I mean, you're not yeah. necessarily seeing new critters, so there's, I don't think there's a reason to do that. And and you use up more air when you're deeper, so why not? If you want to take photos and and look for critters, better off to do it as shallow as possible, right? Sure. Some of my favorite dives have been in really beautiful conditions when you're in 15, 20 feet, yeah. and you can just do that for 70 minutes and find something and take all the photos you want of it yeah it's always been interesting to me because as a photographer you know we can go down and with a macro lens or and even if we don't have our camera with us we can go down with the just with that with our eye to to see some things that most people would just breeze by i can take you know i could spend a whole you know 50 minute dive on one little coral head, looking yeah. at different, you know, nudibranchs, anemones, you know. Yeah, well that's, and you learn what to, that's the other thing about diving locally, is that you learn the sites, so you don't have to worry about the topology. You can learn the creatures, and you can learn where they're most likely to be found. So yeah. nudibranchs, for instance, tend to be found on the things that they eat. So you know, oh, this type, to, you know, if I see these, hydrozoans, I'm probably going to find some nudibranchs on that thing. Um, and, or I found this last time I was here, I'm going to go look for it again. A lot of times you can just do repeats that way. And that's, as a photographer who isn't, you know, going on specific photography trips with a photography group, um, the second best thing I have is to go with a buddy that's willing to, you know, be a buddy to a, a, a photographer yeah. and just be like, cool, like this is the goal of the dive today. I know their mola molas out today. Last time we saw them over here, let's go try to find the mola molas. Um, <laughs> oh, you're, you're killing, killing Todd. <laughs> I, oh. I've, I haven't seen any in whatever it is, 500 some odd dives. And I, I've, I've, it's my favorite thing I've always wanted to see in the water and I haven't seen one yet. So. Uh, well, do you want to hear about the Monterey yes. mola molas? Please tell me. Okay. We'll be up there well, next weekend. All right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, um, so we do get the big ones, uh, rarely that close to shore. Um, I have seen some large, about 10-foot molas uh, on whale-watching boats out to the Farallon Islands, uh, which is pretty amazing. So um, that's a couple hours out of San Francisco, so they're there. But usually in, Mo in uh, Monterey, we get these smaller two to three-foot uh, molas. Um, but there, this is kind of a sad story. So the sea lions like the mola molas. Uh -oh. They like to grab the molas by the fence and fling them out of the water and play frisbee with them. And so I would say maybe about a third of the molas you see are swimming and are happy. And two thirds of the molas you see are on the floor without fins and are, are slowly becoming food for the rest of the ecosystem. Mm. Um, so they're really, really cool, weird creatures. Uh, I love seeing them, but uh, sometimes you get reports of like, oh, there's a mola graveyard over at Lover's Point or something. And oh, no. yeah, sure enough, there might be 12 of them in a little crack that, so some, that some sea lion went crazy. So that explains the shot that you, uh, yes, that you that, took. 
That is a Mola Mola um, still breathing, uh, but not long for this world. And I wanted to, this was actually one of the few shots that I've taken where I, I planned it ahead of time. I was like, I know they're going to be there and they have this wide eyed look always. And I wanted to kind of capture a, a feeling of, um, I don't know, doom, despair, and shock. And, yeah. uh, and I, yeah, so that's, that's where this image came from. And uh, it's sad to see it, but it's also part of the natural world. I mean, it, it just fosters some interesting discussions too. Like, should you try to put them out of the misery? How do you even do that on a mola mola? They're oddly shaped fish. Um, but you also see that the rest of the ocean is moving towards them. And yeah. uh, there are sea stars and crabs that are like, cool, we're, we're down for this. It's a part of the natural cycle there. Yeah. And for everyone listening to podcast, any of the photos that we reference uh, in today's uh, interview, you can either see in the show notes, there'll be links to John's photos there. Or if you happen to be watching on YouTube, you'll be able to see uh, to see them as well. But uh, very cool. So I, I don't know. I don't know if I how I feel about <laughs> going to <laughs> see Mola Mola's only to see them getting tossed around like like frisbees by sea lions. Now, there could be some really, really interesting shots to get, though, but I will, my heart will be breaking at the same time. But it's nature, you know, that is, you know, it's nature. Life. Yeah, that's what underwater photography is all about, is getting a front yeah. row seat on uh, something that you'd have to see on BBC or right. National Geographic. Yeah. That's, that's, now, do you have any resources that you use to learn about the different nudibranchs that you see um, in the Pacific versus you do in the Caribbean. Like I know uh, Ned Deloach puts out a couple of really good books for the tropics. I don't know if he has anything over here in the uh, Pacific or not. I have one book on, I think it's called Pacific Coast Nudibranx. Uh, I, I forget who wrote that one, but that it's a little older, but it checks out. It's great. Um, and then you know, we have a, a underwater photography Facebook group and there's also a species identification group so if you find one you don't know what it is post that and it's amazing within 10-20 minutes someone's going to give oh, wow. you the full taxonomy of of that critter and uh and sometimes you get things you know one of the things that's cool about the, the west coast here is occasionally we get creatures that came in from Japan and we're like how did this end up here um and so having these really rare sightings of things that that uh, show up like you know, you know, there are California mores in Southern California, right. and those those can't breed in California. It's too cold for them to breed. So all of those came over as in the larval state. Um, and so we get some interesting visitors. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had a, a barred knife jaw, this really beautiful fish with um, like a large angelfish looking thing with big black and white stripes on it. And there's one that we found in uh, in uh, Monterey at Breakwater, and it became a little local celebrity for a while because that is a Japanese fish um, that we think came over from the tsunami that happened earlier that summer. Oh, wow. And uh, and we saw it all summer. I haven't seen it in a while, but I got some great photos of it one time when I saw it shallow, really, really close to shore. And it was really cool to get that identification and have people say, yep, that totally is what that is. Uh, That's awesome. Very cool. So do you dive the oil rigs in Southern California or in Northern California? So I, uh, last September, I joined um, uh, Blue Water Photography. They had a trip out to the E-Series oil rigs. Those are outside of San Pedro, so near mm -hmm. Long Beach. And uh, you get on a boat. I think the boat was the Pacific Star. And um, it's really cool. They have three oil rigs there, and they're all active. This is something I didn't realize. When, when I heard, oh, oil rigs, I, I imagine they were like decommissioned, just kind of sitting there right. in the water. No, these things are active. There are boats coming in and out. And so... Uh, it's a bit more advanced to dive because you you have to do a very quick exit off of the boat because they can't actually park the boat anywhere. So they they pull the boat up around uh, so that the rear is facing the oil rig, get you close to superstructure. You got to get off quickly because the boat's got to get away in case there's um, uh, another boat coming in that needs to dock with the oil rig. Um, on the dive itself, you have to stay inside the superstructure of the rig. So you see the big pylons. And so the, that's the safety rule is stay inside that, but you, that gives you a ton of space to work in. It's a, a beautiful, amazing space. Um, and uh, on most of the rigs out there, there's basically a set of cross beams at about 60 feet, and I think there's another one about 90 feet. And so you okay. kind of choose how deep do you want to go, find those cross beams, and then just stay in that superstructure. Every, every beam and pylon is just covered in uh, barnacles, um, uh, fish and anemones, strawberry anemones everywhere. And uh, it was just amazing to see that kind of life uh, on this, this big industrial complex. That's right on. 
That's crazy. And where, did you see any larger fish or pelagic swimming by in the, in the open ocean as you were doing it? Or were you too focused on finding critters to notice what was going on? <laughs> I, mean, I was on the lookout. You know, everyone wants to see. Uh, I mean, they, I've seen some photos from big molas that actually visit those guys. And everyone wants to see a shark or something. But uh, didn't see any pelagics. But there were a number of sea lions that live on the bottom levels of the oil rig. And so it's really funny. This was a photography group for uh, the, their um, SoCal shootout last year. And so everyone had big camera rigs. And right. sometimes a sea lion would come down and start dive bombing every single photographer. And he'd come, <laughs> he'd come up to you, you'd snap a photo and see the flash. And then you'd see some flashes to your left as the sea lion zoomed to your left and zoomed to your right. And, uh, it was really wild to see that. Um, so making that was the rounds. Fun. Yeah, making the rounds, defending their territory. Um, yeah. uh, but like I... You know, I tried to get some good sea line shots. None of them really came out. I'm not really set up for that. I didn't have a wide angle right. lens. Uh, so I ended up sticking with more, you know, what does the life look like on the pylons itself? And right. the other thing is I, um, in Southern California, we got Garibaldi, the, the bright orange yep. fish. And we don't have them in Northern California. And I miss them so much. They're oh, beautiful. really? Yeah, we don't have them up there. Um, so I was, I used to live in Santa Monica for a couple of years. And I dive in Catalina a lot. And so it's been a while since I've done Southern California diving. So it was really great to be back in the water there and see um, the, the stuff that's a little different than Northern California. The Garibaldi are the, the biggest thing. You can see them from a mile away. They're super bright orange. Um, they can be really territorial and inquisitive. Yeah, they're and, a lot uh, of fun. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. And so you were telling me, I think earlier that uh, there was that photography group did a little photo contest. Yeah, this is my first photo contest. It was a really great experience. Got to learn from a lot of the other uh, guys and gals that were taking photos that weekend. Um, and I ended up winning the amateur uh, photo contest. So nice, congratulations. That was really cool. And uh, was it with this photo? Was this the photo that you won with it? No, it actually was, uh, yes, yeah, so it was this purple anemone inside a bed of. Um, oh, okay. Let me find the of other brittle one. stars. LA Riggs. It's at the bottom. Oh, got it. Uh, maybe this one? <laughs> yeah. There it goes. Nice. So, you know, you see these pylons and they are just covered in life. Some of them with um, uh, barnacles, some of them with uh, brittle stars. And I love to see brittle stars, you know, either on the, the seabed or on something like this, where you just see their tentacles sticking up and it looks like grass, like right. living grass. And so that's what I saw here, but then I saw one anemone popping out. And I didn't really think a lot that much of it. It was very, very small an enemy. Uh, so I took the shot and again, then went back to, you know, looking for bigger fish and, and sea lions. But when I went back through my camera reel later, I saw this one, it was pretty blown out. But as soon as I even just hit like the auto color in Lightroom, I was like, ooh, that's gorgeous. Um, and I was able to see like, cool, yeah, the, the purple and blue of the anemone is very, it has a nice contrast to this kind of ring of brittle stars around it, yeah. but it's just all tentacles. And usually when you get a shot full of a lot of tentacles, there's going to be, you know, it doesn't come out as crisp, crisp and clear as this. And you get a lot, uh, a lot of backscatter and other things, but this felt like a lot going on in a photo that still was very clean and crisp. So I, I submitted it. And one of the beauties of shooting raw. Yeah, definitely. Right. This, yep. this did not look good when I was slipping through uh, on my camera. <laughs> <All right. laughs> That's awesome. Great, great shot, though. Thanks for sharing it. So uh, any other things to jump out about the uniqueness of diving an oil rig that you, uh, that you can think of that you haven't already mentioned? Uh, well, more. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's kind of a mix of blue water diving, and, uh, but also having frames of reference with um, you know, the rig itself. You know, when you look off into the distance, uh, we had a pretty good viz day. It was maybe 40, 50 feet mm. of viz. You know, you, you get that feeling of blue water diving, which is, can be incredible. You can feel so small and tiny. But then you, you know, turn to your side and you see the big pile in there. You're cool. I know where I'm at. Um, actually, the rule that you stay inside, I think, made it a very easy dive because you have a, a nice playground to play in. But you also know that, like, you're not going to be out there drifting around. Um, right. And then again, this is, you know, with California diving, the boat, on the boat, you get paired up with a buddy, you, if you don't have one with you, and then they tell you general, you know, I, here's what the, the site's like, and then go do your thing, come back in an hour. Um, yeah. And so uh, being able to do that in a place that feels like blue water diving is pretty great. 
That is awesome. Mm-hmm. How how many of you were on the uh, on that boat? How many were you down at the? One time? The, this actually wasn't that huge. So this was um, a couple weeks after the Conception fire, um, yeah. and and uh, so I think that uh, and, you know, a lot of people in the community knew people who were on that boat, and that was a, a yeah. tragedy. So I think there were fewer people than would have been normally, but I think it was about fifteen uh, of us. Yeah. So it wasn't a huge group, um, which is nice. It's nice to have some room on the boat to move, especially when people, when everyone has a camera rig. Of course, yeah. 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 And that'll, that'll get a boat crowded really quick. But then when you're all 15 of you were down within the rig, you know, you didn't feel cramped or anything like that or bumping into each other that much? Not at all. Because, again, you have that varying height. So yeah. uh, some people are going to go down to those pylons at the 90 feet. Some people are going to stay at 60 um, some people are going to stay on the surface and get really up close with those sea lions. So it gave us enough space. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it was it was great. Highly recommend it. Were there any other dive boats out there with you guys or were you guys the only one? We were the only one. And from what I understand, I believe the Pacific Star has some special arrangement with the companies that own those rigs. So really? I'm not sure how many other boats go out there, um, but they do regular trips, I believe. Very cool. cool. Where are some of your other favorite dive spots? Well, before um, the uh, the stay in place orders, we were lucky to go to New Zealand, Uh, and that was a that was a trip with with my wife and a couple of my friends. And that wasn't a dive trip. That was a like New Zealand is all about mountains and glaciers and Hobbiton and Lord of the Rings stuff. (laughs) Um, But you know, I was like, well, if we're going to be there, if I can have a chance to do some diving, I will. And I'm so glad I did. Because uh, I got to see probably the, the, the two most the two best known sites in New Zealand, and um, uh, one in the North Island, one in the South Island. In the North Island, uh, about an hour and a half, uh, two hours out of Auckland, uh, is a little town called Tutukaka, and you can get on a boat there and go to the Poor Knights Islands. These are a string of islands that are a, a giant marine preserve. Um, like many places, they claim to be one of Jacques Cousteau's favorite places to dive. Uh, <laughs> but it it was really cool because, like. The first, this is the first time we've been to New Zealand, and our takeaway was it really feels a lot like if you took California and Hawaii and smashed them together. It's like, uh, ro- you know, rolling hills, um, but also mountains and volcanoes. And, uh, you know, we were there during the summer, so, like, the weather was nice, uh, but it just really felt like this really interesting mixture of this two. And Four Nights Islands felt like a mixture of Hawaii and California underwater as well. It was uh, still temperate. Um, so we were in, uh, I think we were in five mil, five or seven mil suits. Um, okay. so people dive, dive dry there. Um, but, uh, the, there was kelp, but it also had tropical fish. Got to see like, um, uh, hmm. barber shrimp that, you know, are not normally live there. We're around lots of eels, lots of stingrays, uh, tons and tons of, it was, it was probably the second, you know, second busiest in terms of fish place I've ever been. Uh, and it was beautiful. So that was amazing. Four Nights Islands, it's kind of like a little tropical, little temperate mixed together. And, uh, and it was wonderful. The water was probably like about 50 degrees. Yeah, it was a little warmer than that. I think it was maybe maybe, maybe around 60. So yeah. it still was, you know, colder than, than you'd get in the tropics. But um, uh, it felt wonderful. It was a beautiful day outside. Um, and we had some beautiful dives there. And then later on in the trip, we were in the South Island, and I went into Milford Sound, and um, got a photo of that. Definitely check that out. So Milford yeah. Sound is uh, at the north part of um, Fjordland. So New Zealand has fjords. This is in the South Island, the south the, the, in the south part of the South Island, and uh, you basically are surrounded by these thousand foot cliffs with waterfalls everywhere, um, going straight down into um, it, they call it a sound. It's not actually a sound. It's, it's, it's totally just an inlet into the ocean. So you're just going straight down into salt water and you've got fur seals um, and tons of birds, penguins and whatnot. Right oh, but wow, that's awesome. but the, the unique thing about Milford Sound, besides being in this just beautiful location that's just mind blowing, is that all of that rain, it's one of the rainiest places on earth. And all that rainwater co- coming down those mountains over the waterfalls creates a uh, layer of fresh water on top. So you have like, right you know, between six feet and 30 feet of fresh water with a lot of tannins in it, that's very dark. Um, hmm. And that means that the life that's underneath that water is stuff that's usually found at greater depths. So it's one of the few places you can do uh, just, you know, normal scuba dives and see a ton of black coral. 
um, black coral, which actually looks white, is usually found, I think, like over 300 feet deep. Oh, wow. And it's, you can find it in 20 feet of water there. So it's just really neat to get this almost like uh, deep diving experience when you're only 40 to 60 feet there. Um, and some really cool critters are, are, are there because of it. There were um, uh, spiny dogfish sharks, uh, seven gill sharks live there, uh, some cool nudibranchs. Um, and then the black coral itself is just this, it's weird to be in a very cold, this, the water here is much colder. Uh, we were in uh, semi-dry suits with additional uh, vests. So right a lot of people would, would dive dry there, but um, it was, it was fine. Still a nice day, but it's really interesting to be in this cold environment, but see these giant coral structures with tons of fish and uh, just really kind of get this, it's almost like, almost like doing a night dive at a coral reef. Very uh, nice. cool. Now and do you have a favorite shot from that trip? Uh, I do. Um, let's see, I actually didn't share anything from that one underwater, you, but I do have some other, I have one other New Zealand story if you want to share that. Sure. Go for it. So the third thing I got to do, which wasn't actually diving, uh, but was amazing, was one of the places we stayed was on the other side of the South Island and a place called the Otago Peninsula, um, about 45 minute drive from the town of Dunedin. And uh, we were staying overlooking this beautiful um, inlet and uh, you know, we needed to see it. We saw birds flying everywhere. We heard from the owner of the Airbnb we were staying at that there was a, a fur seal that was hanging out. And it was just one of those places where you, like, having been in beautiful places like Monterey with that are, have a ton of life in them, you just feel like, wait, there's a lot of life here. I can see bird life. I know that there's marine mammals. Um, so the inlet had a really drastic tide. So when it was low tide, you basically would see sand. And when it was high tide, it looked like it was swimmable. And I had my camera and I had a skin suit. I didn't have a wetsuit. Um, but I decided I was just gonna poke, in, poke my head under water and see what was there, uh, just next to this little dock that was near the Airbnb we were staying. And uh, so I jumped in and it was super cold. This was probably, I don't know, 50 degree water. It was really, really cold. I had, didn't have a wetsuit, so maybe not the smartest thing I've ever done. <laughs> but in the span of 20, 25 minutes, I found six different species of nudibranchs um, wow. and tons of little gobies crawling all over the rocks. Like it was definitely the first time where I felt like I recognized from above water that the below water situation is gonna be beautiful and it was. So I do have one photo here of um, this Wellington nudibranch. It's this big yellow okay. guy. This was maybe yep. the biggest nudibranch I've ever seen uh, that wasn't like a Spanish dancer. Um, this guy was huge, like almost a foot long. Really? And just covered in these big yellow pustules. And I got some great photos of it that to me looked, I was going for like a monster movie feel, like this thing is just like oh, coming over the hillside. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, for sure. And that was me, di you know, just holding my camera underwater and diving down six to eight feet and trying to grab a photo before I have to pop back up and, right. uh, and, and then getting out of the water before I froze myself. I um, actually think I see a little orange fish it hiding behind the seagrass beneath its eye just poking out on the bottom there too. Yeah. yeah it's, funny. it's very, definitely very spooky. I like it. Yeah. It's, it was, a uh, it was just wonderful to kind of explore that. And to, I mean, that's the other part about diving is you don't want to just follow in other people's footsteps and um, you know, see the same thing everybody does, or it's great to go on a guided dive and have a guide point things out. But when you discover something, yeah. I think that that, that feeling is just, the thing I'm always chasing is I found this, I'm going to go home and look it up and find out what, you know, what other people know about it. Has anyone seen one this color and things like that? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's that sense of like true exploration. Definitely. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it's also a big benefit of going on self-guided dives. You kind of stick to your own schedule. You got to, you have to, you don't have an expert dive guide, but when you can search for stuff at your own pace and when you do find something, you can stay there as long as you like. Yeah, which is which is great for photographers. So uh, that's so why awesome. I keep coming back to if you have a place you can do shore dives, you know, on a, during a weekend near you, get buddies who go with you, learn that spot, and take advantage of it because that's the way you can have these encounters and really get to know a place. For Absolutely. sure. 
So also, you have, <laughs> we got to <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. So, yeah. Also, like if you're going on a trip, find out if there's good diving around. You know, that was yeah. I didn't know that people I didn't know if New Zealand had good diving or not until I looked it up. And I was excited to pitch to the rest of my travel mates like, hey, do you mind if I go do this while you go do something else for a day? And it was not a problem. Right. That's awesome. Top. Any any other uh, memorable dive trips that jump out at you that you've had in your 183 dive experience that uh, even if it's not photography related, just that uh, sticks out at you that uh, that you really love? Well, um, again, kind of going with the whole self-discovery uh, theme here, uh, I love diving in the big island of Hawaii, um, particularly because the, the famous uh, nighttime manta dives yep. that they do uh, near Kona. And I've been on that dive three times. Mm -hmm. And I've only seen mantas on that dive one time. Uh, and really? Yeah, wow. Yes, we've had two no-shows. Uh, and this is all three different years. So just like really random. And then the one time we had an amazing you know, show up with uh, about 12 mantas, including the big couple of biggest ones they have there, um, my camera flooded as soon as it hit the water uh, oh. for some weird reason so that that was an amazing dive because what happened was um so not only did so my camera flooded i get down there i get on my knee i'm like cool i'm just gonna enjoy the dive you know next to my wife who's also diving with me we're like let's just enjoy these mantas flying over me cool it was beautiful but then i saw something wiggling in the water column I'm like what is that and i saw a bunch of things wiggling in the water column what it was was it happened to be the night that the bearded fireworms were spawning so are you, are you familiar with bearded fireworms? They're all over the Caribbean yeah. and stuff, right? Yeah. They look like giant centipedes with, you know, fuzz sticking out of them. And they're not pleasant to have brush on no. you. Uh, you don't get stuck with them. Well, all of a sudden we were surrounded by hundreds of them in the water and they were falling. They would swim up, release eggs, and then fall down on us. So I had my camera and the only good thing my camera was for that, that dive was to bat the fireworms off of me and my wife and the guy next to me. Uh, <laughs> So we're batting fireworms. When a manta would fly, swim into a fireworm, it would basically explode into eggs. So it just, it just turned into craziness. It was nuts. It's still amazing. Complete mayhem. Yeah. Absolutely oh, mayhem. Man. But what we do is uh, we've, uh, they also do blackwater dives there. So yes. yeah. if you go to the big island, I highly recommend pay the extra money to do the manta plus blackwater combo. Because if the mantas don't show, you at least have another dive, which is amazing. And the blackwater dives are incredible. You're on a tether to a yep. boat um, out in the middle of the current over 5,000 feet of water, and uh, you've got your lights, and then you're just seeing tiny squid, bobtail squid, shrimp, uh, anything, all these little pelagics coming up to you, weird things you've got no clue what they are until you look them up later. Yeah, and you get a lot of deep water uh, yeah. fish and critters yeah. that come up. So do they take you right from like you go, here's the, the mantas and they take you, load you back up and take you right out to sea to do the black water dive or how does that, how did that work? They, uh, there's a bit of a, uh, there's a bit of a break in between level. They take you back to shore and then um, usually get a much smaller group to go to the black water dive. Got it. So, that makes uh, sense. But it's very, very highly worth doing and it's really hard to take photos of this stuff. So I finally on my last Blackwater dive, I was able to start to get some decent photos, but not great. I'm excited to do it again because the people who do it well are amazing. So yeah, tell us, since it's also on my list of things I've always wanted to do, but haven't done yet. So what, what tips do you have if I'm going to go for my first Blackwater dive? What are some lessons learned from your first time that you'd uh, change for next time? Uh, well, I, uh, one thing is, you know, it's, it's kind of like swimming through a snow field. You see little specks of stuff being illuminated by your, your light. Um, you have to have a, a good light on. So it's, I, I would basically just use a, a nice focus light focus as your dive light. light. That way you don't have to have a dive light and your camera. Um, and you don't necessarily need the biggest rig. I think a focus light and a single strobe is probably a good way to go. The challenge is going to be focusing on these things. So um, so if you've got a good uh, manual focus or um, thumb focus, so you can kind of dial it in manually and then try to push your camera into the critter and get yeah. that focus to line up, that's the way to go. Um, the, the Olympus TG5 does not have a thumb focus and its manual focus is really hard to do in the housing. So what I ended up doing was sticking my hand in front of my camera, focusing Focus on my hand and, and leaving then, it there then moving right. my hand yeah. and then, then leaving it there. Yeah. And uh, you know, there were last time we were there, there were, we had um, dozens of these tiny, uh, like popcorn-sized bobtail squid, and they were super cute. 
So I took some photos of those. I've got some seahorses. The first time I've seen a seahorse was in the middle of the Black Ocean in Hawaii. That's oh, wow. pretty amazing. Crazy. Um, and we had schools of squid that swam all through us and bounced off of you and all this stuff. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a bonkers experience. And the other thing is maybe if you're first time, don't take a camera. It's definitely one of those ones where it's, it's okay just to soak it in and it's going right. to be such a weird experience that um, it probably worth it just, just to be there and just feel it. That's awesome. And bobtail squids are also some of my favorite critters too. They're, They're so, so cute. Good. They're so yes. cute. So I, I can't imagine seeing them out and just, I've only seen them on the seafloor, you know, and, uh, but they're cute enough there, but to see them flying around in the, in the ocean would be awesome. That's really cool. Uh, but to come back to my first point here about exploration. So we had only one out of three times we've done the manta dive have manta showed up, but you can go snorkeling off of one of the resorts there, the Mauna Kea, and uh, they have a light that they shine into a local reef, and that beach is a public beach. And if you're there at night, you can jump in the water. And I've been there three times and had mantas every single time. And so, uh, so my favorite thing to do on the Big Island is to jump in the water with my camera. And last time it was like me and three, no, actually I had five last time, me and five manta rays for an hour. Um, oh, well. just, just me and that wow. manta rays. And that's amazing, just to get this feeling of you're there, it's a little scary, you know, it's nighttime. Um, but, uh, and that's what, I have a photo here, uh, that we'll, we'll link to of, um, one of the mantis I took from, from that. And, uh, it's just amazing to be alone with these wild creatures and to see how they, uh, they'll be attracted to your light and come up really close to you, but they're so graceful, even though they're so huge. Um, and, uh, they're just miraculous. So I, that's my favorite thing to do. It's also great to know that even if your guided dive doesn't, give you the critters you want. Just get more water time and you never know what you're going to find. Yep. Right on. Things might not show up on this dive, but they'll show up on the next one or the one after that. So you say that uh, again, just to repeat one more time, where the snorkeling spot was that you went to go hang out with the mantas? Yeah. So there's a resort called the Mauna Kea and they have a, they actually have a restaurant called Manta, which is pretty great to eat at. Good brunch, amazing nice. brunch. And they have a little overlook, um, like a little path through an overlook. And so what happens is people at night will go down there at the overlook. It's just like a nice little deck area and they can watch the mantas in the water. Um, but you also could just go down to the beach and then swim over to where the mantas are and hang out with them. They do some guided snorkels there too, I believe. Uh, when I got in the water last time, there was a snorkel group of maybe 12 people there, um, but mostly kids. And it was neat because when I got in the water, I, uh, I looked to my right and saw a big white tip reef shark. Um, <laughs> and I, I wanted to make sure that whoever was leading that snorkel group knew that there was a, a shark nearby, but I didn't want to, you know, scare the kids. So I just said, there's a white tip over here, FYI. And um, so I heard someone yell back, yeah, yeah, we know. And then they left pretty shortly after that. And then I didn't see the shark again, and I had the mantas all to myself. So that's awesome. <laughs> maybe that's a hot tip to uh, get the snorkelers out of the way. Even if there's there's a <laughs> side note, tell them, say, hey, there's a shark. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's awesome. Very nice. cool. Well, definitely have to go there too, Dalton. We got to make it to the big island and, and do the manta dive and do some blackwater diving. For sure. For sure. So you worked on a VR game that was based on underwater? Yeah, I had a super, super fortunate uh, job about a year and a half ago. I worked with a team called Weaver. Uh, they're based out of Venice on a location-based VR experience called the Blue Deep Rescue. Um, Weaver had created one of the earliest v underwater VR experiences called The Blue uh, a few years prior, and it's still one of the best ways to introduce people to virtual reality if they haven't tried it yet. Um, it's for you know computer-based VR headsets, but with The Blue, uh, introduce people to was you got to stand on a, uh, a shipwreck and have a life-size blue whale swim by you. And the oh. cool thing about VR is like, you know, we can actually make it life-size and you can feel what a hundred foot animal feels like underwater, uh, along with, uh, you know, hearing spatialized sounds. So if you've got a good speaker set up or good headphones, you know, you feel the, uh, their call as they're, they're calling coming by you. Um, so I get to work on a version of this that was uh, in partnership with a company called Dreamscape. And so you can actually, this was launched in LA and Dallas and Columbus, Ohio and Dubai. Um, Dreamscape has these locations you can go and you buy a ticket, kind of like a movie theater, and you and five other people 
put on a headset and a backpack computer, and you can walk around a stage and go on a, a VR experience adventure. Oh, wow. um, that sounds pretty cool. It's, it's really cool. Uh, it was really neat as a, as a diver to be able to take some of my favorite experiences and try to virtualize those. And it's challenging because this is only about a 20 minute, it's almost like a ride, like a Disney right. ride, right? Right. So you're trying to get, um, you know, I, I, I've talked about like, it's like 10 years of diving experience crammed into 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, you know, we've got turtles and we have harbor seals and we have manta rays and we have sharks and, um, and it's, but it was really neat to be able to like say, cool, I think that uh, let's put some more manta rays over here and when should they come out? Uh, and how should they act if the player tries to reach up and touch them? Um, one of the things I added was we had a, a, a section where you go down to a shipwreck and you have a flashlight built into your, your, your arm. It's kind of like um, uh, one of the light in motion wrist mount flashlights. And, uh, and that was really, really atmospheric to be able to shine that light around and see sharks in the distance. And the sharks kind of get spooked when you, when you shine the light over there. But we had these big groupers that were AI. Uh, controls. These are fish that can swim around the area you're in, and I wanted to make sure that if you shine your light in the grouper's face, it freaks out and goes away, just like it would in real life. Right. And so it's really fun to see these big Nassau groupers that kind of come up to you, and then you know when you look at them and shine your light, they, they kind of swim off a little bit, and then if you put your light down, they'll kind of creep back up to you. And so it's just trying to get some of that behavior into this experience, let people get a, a little taste of what uh, diving might be like. Fair enough. How long did how long did you work on the project? I was on that project for about seven months, so in the middle of okay. the production. Um, you know, these projects take you know a large team of really talented people, and uh, uh, Weaver worked with Dreamscape to do that. And it was challenging because they were, you know, I was actually working remotely from San Francisco, so this is also why I think this was the best job I ever had because I got to get wake up, be in my pajamas, and then like create a scene with a blue whale in my living room. Um, it was a dream. So that was pretty, pretty amazing. That's awesome. Any plans to do any more VR work? Uh, it's probably up to them if they have other, other projects or Deep Blue Part 2. <laughs> yeah, I, like that. yeah, I don't know what Weaver's up to. I, I sure hope so. I think it's been challenging with the, um, you know, for anything that's location-based like this with the, 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 wow. the lockdown. So hopefully they'll open up again. Dreamscape will open up again soon. You should definitely check it out if you live in the LA, Dallas, or Columbus. And Hopefully they'll spread out to other places. You can people can try this with their their fam, friends and family. Well, Dalton, we'll definitely have to. You and I definitely have to go and check this out once once we're allowed to leave the house. That is yes, for sure. <laughs> now, awesome. did you uh, go to school back east, or did you uh, go to school out here in California? I went to school at Georgia Tech and okay. studied studied computational media, which is kind of like half computer science and half just digital media and video games and three D yeah. stuff. So perfect for video games and VR and I most of my career has been in traditional video games like you play with a controller on a TV but um, when yes uh, including including doing some of the work on one of my favorite all-time video games Uncharted Uncharted you got to work on yes. Uncharted 3 uh, yeah. I, I I'm, don't play many video games right now but I have some exceptions I started I stopped in the late 90s I said look as soon as if, if there's a new video game that comes out, either by uh, Steam that's a Half-Life sequel or an Uncharted sequel, I will play those. But otherwise, I'm done with video games. But yeah. Uncharted was one of my favorites, and, and uh, so tell just uh, just for fun, why don't you tell people what you got to to work on for Uncharted Three? Yeah, well, I was fortunate to work with the awesome team at Naughty Dog on Uncharted Three and Uncharted Four a little bit. Um, for Uncharted Three, I uh, was kind of the designer in charge of the intro sequence, which is a Guy Ritchie-esque uh, <laughs> classic pub brawl, yes. uh, bar fight. And so that was a really cool experience because you got to, you know, we're teaching players how to use the game system. So here's the buttons you press to fight and here's how you, you duck and here's how you dodge. Um, we want to teach you those systems, but in a way that still feels like you're playing through a movie. And uh, if you haven't seen these games, they're basically like a modern day Indiana Jones, like a treasure yeah. hunter. Uh, Nathan Drake is the main character, and he's kind of a, a one-liner Kraken uh, adventure guy. And um, and so he's, of course, going to get into fights in a bar, and he's going to raid some tombs, and he's going to swing on ropes and all that stuff. Um, but you got to teach players how to do this while you also make a cinematic experience. And I got to work with stuntmen to do the motion capture for it. And uh, yeah, some of the stunt crew had worked with Jackie Chan in the past, and that was just really amazing. What? Like, oh, yes. what? Uh, and, That's awesome. 
it was really cool. So it's really neat to see how we can create these virtual experiences to make you feel like you're playing a movie. And um, in Uncharted 4, they had, uh, there's actually diving in it. So the actually opening scene is a diving scene. I won't spoil it. But if you haven't played 4, <laughs> check it out. It's got some All great right. scuba diving I've, I've played the whole Drake series, yeah. even the ladies of Drake. All right. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, we're both big fans. But anyways, great work on that. Let's see it. That's uh, pretty cool to have... Uh, such an awesome profession and then then bringing in and pull from your passion of scuba diving and 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 bring that into your work a little bit that's fantastic yeah, i'd love to do that more in the future i think there's it there's a real fertile ground because um people who can't get down and see a coral reef like it, it's hard to you, know, you can watch some a bbc special or blue planet which are amazing but to really feel it around you i think is a different thing and so for people who have access to vr headset there's a lot of amazing 360 videos um, there's a group called Oceans 360 that has been documenting a whole lot of places all over the world in 360 video form, so you can feel like you're actually there on a dive. And then there, there are all kinds of other experiences. Um, one of my favorites is called Ocean Rift, and it has these, they're, they're rendered 3D sea lions and dolphins that have a really, really amazing AI. And they kind of swim all around you and bob up and down and just look, they feel so realistic. You know, having been in the water with sea lions, having a VR sea lion that feels just just like like a realistic one is really amazing. Um, so so, cool. so from VR you have things that are going for realism. You also have things like there's a game uh, called Subnautica that's about it's kind of like a sci-fi planet that's all underwater, and so they kind of take inspiration from crazy critters at different levels of of uh, the sea, and they kind of jam them together to make new weird, interesting creatures. And you can go explore that, and they really nail the feeling of exploration and discovery that diving can give, even though it's a sci-fi game. So it's been cool to see that we have the technology to start bringing some of this into people's lives. And I hope that it, it gets people curious about diving, it gets them curious about photography, and hopefully uh, gets them to want to help save our oceans. So that's, that's the big thing. You know, I don't want my kids to only be able to experience this stuff in VR. I want to be able to show them in VR and then say, and let's go get certified and then hop in right. the water in LA or in Monterey and go see it. That's fast. Right that's on. awesome. That's awesome. So do you have any uh, big, other than your local dives, are there any big dive trips that you're hoping to do in the, ne in the near future? Well, I uh, got a trip to Fiji planned and okay. hoping that that will happen. Um, so that's going to be exciting. I'm uh, excited to put the wide angle uh, lens to use and take some really beautiful shots of the, um, the soft coral there. Are you going up to Taviuni or, uh, or do you know where, you're, where in Fiji you're going yet? We're going to be going to the Bly Waters, um, Bly Waters, yep, and then staying a resort a little bit further out. That's, uh, okay. uh, but uh, yeah, so not not doing the shark dive there. Um, yeah, but uh, really excited about just getting back in the water again because it's been a few months. And that's the big thing is I'm I'm excited to get my dive gear and go to back to Monterey sometime soon. Hopefully, the uh, shops have just started uh, opening up in terms of doing curbside uh, tank fills and things like that. So. Yeah. People getting back in the water, you know, if you go with a buddy that you know, like it's one of the safer things I think you could do right now. So, um, so I'm excited to get back in the water and get my, my camera finger <laughs> back in motion. Yeah, I know they just started uh, opening up Catalina by appointment only for the uh, dive shop right there where they do at, the At Casino bills. Point? Yeah. 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 I love that place. I mean, how bad? I mean, how bad can it be when you have staircase into the water? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> uh, one of my dives with my wife at Casino Point was great. So Casino Point's just it is yeah. literally there's like a it used to be I don't know if it still is it was like a truck trailer that the dive shop mm -hmm. was in. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah still the same. And still? yeah, you just rent your stuff, gear up right there, and then there's giant steps, and boom, you're in kelp forest as soon as you hit the water. Well, one time I was actually climbing out of the steps, so I was on maybe the first step. And my wife goes, octopus. And I stuck my head in, and in the seagrass is a GPO, a giant Pacific octopus. What? Uh, uh, it was the biggest octopus I've ever seen. And we're just like, what? And it literally was five feet from the steps there. Oh, wow. That, that that's crazy. Big. So it's just, that's what I love about, you know, these places that are full of life that we've been able to protect and turn into marine preserves. Yeah. You never know what's going to be there. Um, yeah, I know they've got a couple of resident giant sea bass that are probably three or four hundred pounds. Nice. <laughs> yeah, we run into they're them massive. a few times. They're 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 really cool. But I would have loved to seen a giant octopus also. Yeah, for sure. So that's fantastic. 
Well, I tell you, this has been uh, such a fascinating interview. Thank you so much for sharing all these yeah, it's experiences, been a lot of fun. John. Thanks for, you, jo- for joining us. Thanks for having me. And can, can you tell us uh, where people can f- go see more of your work? Do you have any uh, social media sites or websites you can point point the folks to? Yeah, I'm on Instagram, but I, I really need to update it. Uh, but I got some good photos up there. Um, need to add some more, but uh, you just look for John Bernhelm. Uh, it's B-E-R-N-H-E-L-M, and you'll find me. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time. Uh, look forward to keeping in touch with you and hopefully we can go diving together sometime soon. Maybe we'll go up and do a shore dive with you up in Monterey area. Yeah, come on up. We'll do some cold water diving. And I'll anytime shoot. you're down in we, LA. We may, you and me might have to drag Dalton in the water kicking and screaming, but uh, I think we can do it. Right on. That'd be great. Well, thank you so much, Todd and Dalton, and keep, keep rocking with this awesome podcast. Absolutely. Thanks. thanks. It was great meeting you, John, and uh, we'll talk to you later, bud. All right. See you, John. Thanks. Adios. Bye.